Uh, God bless you. Uh, if you're visiting for the first time, I'm not a special person. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Before we go in, we'd like to call Daniel and James. Uh, uh, they're members of our body, and we'd like to pray for them as they relocate. They've been serving faithfully in the worship team. Let's give it up for those guys. It's good to see grown men who shave, who use Gillette, serve in the house of the Lord. Man's men, but just humbly uh, serve. They've been faithful. They've been consistent on the drums, on the bass. Uh, so they'll be leaving. When, when do you head out? Uh, 25th. 25th, and you're out? Let's, let's just pray for them, uh, faithful brothers, uh, Daniel and, and James, so that God is with them. Let's just stretch our hands uh, out to them and say, Lord, we thank you. Uh, for this, the, the man you have chosen, your servants. Thank you for their faithfulness. Uh, Lord, when we look at them, we realize there's hope. There's hope for the nations. There's hope for homes. How they carry themselves faithfully in your house and in their own lives. And Lord, thank you for this uh, new season that you're taking them uh, to. Lord, we pray, we acknowledge that you've already gone ahead of them and you've made every rough place smooth and you'll put light where there's darkness. Bless everything that concerns them, O oh God. And Lord, may they thrive as disciples of Jesus Christ in that land. And Lord, may you send people. Uh, may, they be, may they find a community of believers that they can be planted in and, st and still live for you. And Lord, we pray that we emulate what they've represented and what they have done uh, for your glory and for our joy. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's give it up for those guys. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, let's pray for the word. Let's, let's pray one more time. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to open the Bible. It's, it's your mind, your very mind, the very mind of God that we have access to it. So, Lord, we help, us to, help me to approach it with a sacredness. Uh, but Lord, we acknowledge that everything we need to hear for life is in your word. Everything we need to hear for godliness is in your word. And we thank you that through your word, that which we do not know, you teach us. That which we do not have, you give us. And that which we are not, you make us through your word. And we pray for every other place in this nation and in the nations of the world where your gospel is being preached. May Christ be exalted and may man be drawn to him. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So this morning I'm continuing with a series that uh, Craig started us on uh, for the last two weeks. Um, I feel like that guy, you know that guy when the, when the match is about to end, they put in a guy for three minutes just as a delaying tactic. <laughs> the team has already won because I feel like Craig did such a splendid job uh, in the last two weeks. Uh, and there's been many, many people who have, uh, people have responded to this message in different ways. Uh, this last week, we had a couple donate a van, a spanking new van to the church. Can we give it up for that? That's just, that's amazing. Uh, there's someone who brought a cell phone. It's like, here's a cell phone for Jesus. So as the Lord moves you, whatever the Lord moves you, if it's a goat, if it's a cow, just... <laughs> Just uh, obey and, 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 and just give it uh, to the Lord. Generosity. Uh, it's a topic that you hardly hear in this church um, because, one, people have generally been very generous uh, in this church. Um, but it's also not an easy topic to preach because money is a trigger in lots of ways. There are people who are in this church because you left your church because they're talking so much about money. And you're like, I like this church because they never talk about money. <laughs> uh, which is good, well and fine. But the Lord spent, spent a lot of time. There are people who say the Lord spent more time talking about money than he did about heaven and hell. Uh, which is true. It's not, it's not to underscore the importance of money. 
But it's showing you how much people were preoccupied with money, even in the time when Jesus lived. That they were constantly thinking about ways to earn it, to spend it, to save it, and to find it. So hence the Lord continuously talking about it, right? Uh, because the Lord was continuously addressing uh, the, the subject. Uh, and whether we have it or not, uh, just go to slide before, just whether we have it or not, uh, the Bible says the love of money is the root of all. And it's talking about both its presence and its absence. <laughs> it's not talking about the presence of money. That's why the following verse says, some by craving for it have wandered away from the faith. Not having it. Some by craving for it have actually wandered away uh, from the faith. But it's important that we, we have this conversation because of how much scripture has given time to talk about it. It's not an easy job because you're trying to find safe ground and you're still trying to find what the Lord uh, says about it uh, faithfully uh, without appearing like you're doing a fundraising, which we're not. We're just trying to say, okay, Lord, what is your mind uh, about money? Because 50% of our wake time, we spend it thinking about money. My older brother has a theory. Uh, I've not proved it yet. Uh, ever since we were young Christians, he used to say, always used to tell me, says, TC, three quarters of the things that you pray for, you wouldn't pray for those things if you had money. <laughs> it's because you're broke. <laughs> it says you're praying for scholarships, you're praying for this. If you had money, you'd be praying for missionaries in Bangladesh, in Pakistan. You'd be praying for the things that matter. Uh, I haven't proven that theory. That's just my brother. It's not the Bible. And it's not word. That's just him. Uh, but we want to summarize what, uh, what uh, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 uh, talk about. Let me just give a bit of context uh, before we go in there. What's happening is Paul is trying to, is fundraising uh, for the Christians uh, in Jerusalem. Uh, so he's trying, in the process is... Uh, so he's, he's fundraising, he's raising money for Christians, for Jews who are in that place because there was a hardship uh, that they were going through. So as he makes this collection in the process, he begins to, uh, he finds this as a teaching opportunity for people to learn about the principles of giving. What is God's mind for giving in the process? How does he teach them on this background? He teaches them one he says, look at the example of our Lord, Jesus Christ. Uh, second thing, he says, look at the example of the Macedonian, the churches in Macedonia. It was not one church. It was churches that were in northern Greece, and the churches were three. That's the Philippi, the Thessalonica, and the Bereans. That's where the book of Philippians and Thessalonians, Bereans, you find them in Acts chapter 17. Those are the three churches that he now gives us. Some of like, look at these three churches, Right? And you see some of that conversation, even when he writes to the Philippians, it makes reference to this event uh, about uh, funds. So he says the example, but the second thing he talks to them, he says, even as we give, he explains to them, he urges them and ex exhorts them to give. And he says, you know what, you should give. Uh, because of the Lord, look at the example of your brothers and sisters, uh, but here's a need, here's a gospel need that is there begins to supply the information that this is the need that is there. What is happening in that place during that time is people were going through suffering and hardship for three reasons. One, there were pilgrims that had come. Uh, they had no money, they had nothing. They had come to the center uh, of religion. Uh, second thing, there were people who were persecuted for the reason that they gave their lives to the Lord because this is just after, the, after uh, people had crucified the Lord so people uh, are believing in the person who was hated, who was despised. So because of that persecution and that belief in Christ, there was loss of income, there was loss of jobs, there was loss of family, there was loss of social status, right? That's the other reason this massive need is there. The third reason is just economic hardships during this time because the Roman government had really impoverished uh, people during that time. There was so much need. That's why you find in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4, people are selling their homes to meet the overwhelming needs of other Christians because there were such economic hardships on the common person 
Uh, so that is sort of like uh, the background. So he gives them the example, he urges them. But the third thing that he does in chapter 9 is that he begins to talk to them about the benefits of giving. He's like, here's an example of the Lord. Here's an example of the brothers. Here's why you should give. And make sure you even report. He even talks about financial reporting, that we're going to report it. He reports this in Romans chapter 15, verse 25. We report it in verse 24, he talks about it. It says, give proof and evidence that this money has gone to this use, right? And then lastly, chapter 9, he begins to say, uh, giving has benefits. Generosity has benefits. And we'll look at it. And a simple definition from, from just this two passages of generosity. Allow me to read uh, a few verses, and then we'll refer back to some. It says in uh, 2 Corinthians 8 from verse 1, We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For even in a severe test of hardship and affliction, the abundance of joy and the extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their path. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means, of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. There is the need there. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. Accordingly, we urge Titus that as he has started, so he should complete uh, among you this act of grace. But as, excel, as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in earnestness, and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love also is genuine. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for the sake, for your sake he became poor, so that, uh, so that you by his poverty might become rich. And in this matter I give my judgment. This benefits, this benefits you, who a year ago started not only to do this work, but also to desire to do it. So generosity here is a natural, consistent, systematic, and occasionally spontaneous giving of ourselves, right, of who we are and what we have to God. Uh, as a response to what God did. Romans 8 verse 32 says, he did not spare his own son, right? And says, what more grace shall he give to us, him who do not spare to his own son? So it becomes a, a posture towards God and others as a response to his love. Uh, and, and, and our sac response to his love should be one of cheerful sacrifice and generosity. So generosity is something that is part of our identity as Christians. Usually, just in society, when we talk about generosity, it's spoken as just a personality trait that is unique to certain individuals. Like, ah, this person is generous. <laughs> it's not something that should apply uh, to everyone. But as you look, next, next slide. As you look at this gospel, you might have come across this will. It's, it's, it's crafted differently in, in, in different places. This is basically a, a tool just to gauge our growth in our discipleship journey, right? At the center is a gospel-centered life, a Christ-centered life, right? This is when you decide that I am no longer at the center of my own life, but Christ is my Lord and Savior. And the spokes that are coming out are the, now the fruits of the gospel and the Holy Spirit. So those are just five key areas that we can use as barometers and indicators of how we are growing as disciples. Number one, we know prayer and Bible intake, right? That uh, the, more, uh, the more you love the Lord and the, one of the indications of growing in Christ is dependency on God. In human evolution, the less you depend on your parents or guardians, it's the more mature you are. But in the Lord, the more you depend on the Lord, the more desperate you are for the Lord, is actually the more mature you are. But unfortunately, sometimes we want to carry it into our Christian journey and think that now I depend less on the Lord, so I'm mature. 
So that's one of the indicators, prayer, communion, and coming into contact. The other one is evangelism and missions, right? Most people who are filled with the Holy Spirit in the Scripture, they didn't become mystical. They became missional, right? They see, that is, this is God who is loving and who loves others, whose desire is to reach the lost. So evangelism, that's another indicator. Another outworking is community, right? You can love God and hate his people. Like I've, I think I've said this before, that the New Testament has no context for a Christian who's not in church. Right? You cannot be a Christian. I keep saying that salvation is not like a KFC meal or chicken in meal where you can order one pizza without chips, where I just want Jesus as my Savior, but not his people. It's not possible in the Lord. His church is part of your salvation package. You can't be Christian and not be actively belonging uh, or involved in his community. And the other thing is character, which is the fruits of the Holy Spirit, right? That's the outworking, uh, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. The Bible doesn't call it the fruits. It calls it what? One. It's the fruits uh, of the Holy Spirit, that everything comes from that relationship. But another indicator is generosity. Because it's consistent with the nature of, of God is the essence of who he is, that for God so loved, that God is love. And it's generous, is God who is giving God. So generosity is a big indicator of our faith and our walk. Next slide. And here's what we're called. We're called to live as stewards. <laughs> called to live as stewards. A steward is a person who's been entrusted with one another's resources who seeks to manage those resources according to the owner's vision and values, right? Each of us were created for stewardship. Remember Genesis 1 uh, for dominion. I've given you dominion over the earth and authority to govern all the resources. So we're accountable to the owner of the resources. We are caretakers. We are recipients and managers of God's resources. Here's what happens. Imagine an investment manager in a bank or a banker, if he wakes up and he has made a deal and it's brought about a billion U.S. dollars, they're excited. But in that point, he does not confuse who owns the money. God's, God giving you his resources, he doesn't stop from owning the resources that he has given you. So this banker does not confuse the resources that have come as his. If he does, it's actually called stealing. That's why the Bible says, will a man rob God? It says, will a man rob God? You're not managing, it's basically saying you're not managing the resources, you're confusing. Because First Chronicles, this is First or Second Chronicles, forgetting the right address there, which says everything, we have given you everything from your hand. It says, from your hand, we have given you. We have given you. So our calling is to be stewards. Everything that we have, what is it that we have that he has not given to us? But here are a few descriptions that are coming from this, from this passage, some that were mentioned in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the previous thing. Number one, generosity is more than money. It's, 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 it's what I talked about. You should check out a book called Counterfeit Gods by Tim Keller when he's talking about the power that money has over the potential to dominate us on how it can easily become an idol, a source, an idol of approval, where we use it as a security idol. That our trust, remember when Timothy was told, teach the rich not to trust in riches, but to trust in God who richly provides, right? That we can easily, our hope can easily be transferred into material things, right? And we use it as, an, as a security idol. The second thing, we can use it as an approval idol, right? And the third thing, we can use it as a control idol. So that's what he's talking about. That, it's more, than, it's more than that. God is not asking, he's not trying to get money out of your pockets, but he's trying to get idols out of your heart. 
And remember, the basic definition of idol is anything that you sin to get and you sin if you don't get. That thing is an idol in your life. Anything in your life that you're willing to sin to get and you sin if you do not get, that's an idol. And Craig mentioned this, that God doesn't want to have your money, but he wants to make sure that your money doesn't have you. He wants to make sure that it's about, do you trust in him? Like even the essence of a tithe, and we'll, I'll make mention, I'll make reference to it at some point, that it's actually not about God who, who needs money or some fundraising gimmick. In essence, at the, there, it's about trust. That do you trust me? Are you able to give back to me? I'm the one who provides. It's the same thing with the Sabbath, the rest, right? That God delivered these guys. They used to work every day. They used to work so that they eat. They used to eat so that they work. But God got them out of slavery. And he said, I want you not to do anything for a day. And these guys are thinking, dude, we can't eat if you don't work. And if you don't work, he says, no, no, I want to show you that I am your provider. It's not your work that is your source of your income or your sustenance. But it is me who actually provides. So it's more than just money. It's about where your trust is. It helps us like uh, Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2 to fix our eyes on Jesus. Hence the invitation. Hence the command to give. So it's more than just the giving of money, but it starts with the giving of self. 2 Corinthians 8 verse 5 here it says, and this not as you expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. To us. To us. It's, it's, it's more than that. That God wants your life first. It's primarily about personal devotion to Jesus. It's primarily about you saying, I totally belong to Christ. I've given myself to the Lord. I've sacrificed myself. I present myself as a what? As a living sacrifice. Someone say that in the Old Testament, they used to present dead sacrifices, right? An animal that is dead. But in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, we are asked to present living sacrifices. So you're supposed to present yourself as a living sacrifice at the altar. But I say the challenge with a living sacrifice is that it can crawl away. <laughs> because it's living. <laughs> so you can just say, ah, no, man, let me leave. The giving of yourself. Until... It begins here. Until it begins here, it has not begun. It has not started. And until it begins here, it will never end. Because it says they gave off themselves. There are on occasions where the, the, the lowest form of giving is actually money. <laughs> there are occasions this world where the lowest form of giving is actually money. But the giving of self. Because that's the example that the Lord did. Because he's saying that, next point, as a response to God's generosity. Verse 9, this is what it says. For you know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. He begins to point them to the work of the cross. That our giving is not primarily to supply a need, but it is primarily to glorify God by reflecting our gratitude and our appreciation and the value that we place on what he did on the cross. And here when it says he became poor, it's not talking about economically that he was disadvantaged, he was surviving on food stamps. That's not what he's talking about. So that we drive nice cars. That's not what he's talking about. It's saying who he was as God. He left glory. He forsook Philippians. It says he did not consider uh, being God as something to be grappled with. But he emptied off himself. Imagine God. Him, God from everlasting to everlasting. God who's living water that will never thirst again. He says his water will never thirst. Imagine he came, became man, 
and he started being thirsty like one of us. Imagine God choosing to become thirsty, choosing to become hungry, choosing to become limited, choosing to become, to be mocked by people he created. Like I remember, I was raised by an African mother and I, I learned that from her, like this woman created me. Because when I was young, she used to tell you, I'll put you back where you came from. I was like, whoa. <laughs> that sounds scary. But she, she, it's exactly it's like, I dare not mock this woman. Who created. And you know, an African mother, when she calls you by your full name, your nickname, and everything, like, Tatenda is she, you're like, hey. <laughs> it's my creator on earth, right? It's, it's, it's the same thing that Jesus allowed himself to be mocked emptied of himself. And what did he give, you might ask? He gave forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness of sins. He adopted us. What he gave, imagine what he emptied. You and I are adopted. We're in the kingdom of darkness. Now we're in his marvelous light. We're not a people, but now we're a people. We're not part of the commonwealth of Israel. That gift that I'm now a child. It says, I no longer call you slave. I'm now a child of God. Do you know that God is as committed to you in equal measure that he is committed to his son, Jesus Christ? That's what adoption is. That God is just as committed to you as he is committed to his son. What gift is that? Undeserving people. He gave us an in eternal inheritance. Ephesians chapter 1 from verse 1 to 14, that we're seated with him, we're blessed with him, we are holy in him, we are righteous in him, we are sealed in him. Re read Ephesians 1 from verse 1 to 14. All the things that we are in Christ Jesus. And this identity that he has given to us, not what we have. You see, here's an amazing thing about the, the, the disciple uh, John in the, in the Bible. You know, most of us, our identity is based on, on what we like. If I ask you, who are you? Like, uh, I like golf. I like traveling. I love this. I love this. I love this. Even your companion. But John was not identified. You know what, how John would call himself? He'd call himself John, the disciple that Jesus loved. <laughs> His identity was based on who loved him and what, what he did for him. Right? It's like, guys... That's what Paul now is, he teaches this, he says, look at this generosity. Look at this radical generosity. We can never pay it back. So Peter talks about, we were, uh, you were not saved with perishable things such as silver and gold from the futile ways of your forefathers, but such as the blood of Jesus that was without blemish. And one of my favorite verses about Jesus dying is Acts chapter 20. It talks about God himself purchase the church with his own blood. I think I mentioned this before, the, in the church that I grew up in, Hatfield Baptist Church, senior minister there, every, every time for all the years I was in, before he took the offering, he used to say one thing. He used to get up and say, saints, I want you to think about the importance of the gospel. And then I want you to think about the urgency of this message and then give according to your estimation of those two things. Sit down. <laughs> That's why when we give when in a room, you shouldn't be giving. When you think about giving, you shouldn't use a calculator. You should sit down with the cross of Jesus and look at it and say, what did it cost him? What is my response? How do I reflect such an act? It's a response. <laughs> to the cross of Jesus Christ. It's our love and our reflection. It's not payback. <laughs> it's what it is. It's a response to that. But the other thing is that it's biblically, biblically constrained and personally determined. Here's an interesting verse. Uh, first he mentions it here. Um, uh, grace... Uh, for they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means, right? 
And he mentions it again in 9 verse 7. He says, uh, where is it? My eyes are beginning to play. With, age is finally catching up with, uh, well, it, it caught up about 10 years ago. But <laughs> it says they gave be in their means and they still gave beyond their means. That each one must give as his heart, as decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. This is what it means in that statement. One, basically he's saying, and throughout the Bible, that we give to causes that enable God's kingdom to advance and to flourish. And he's saying, two, we cannot be manipulated or coerced into giving. We shouldn't do that. We shouldn't do gimmicks or anything. We allow the spirit to move in the hearts of people. But it's also saying on that thing, it's like, no, people should give what's proportionate uh, to what they have. It's saying they gave within their means, first of all. Right? It's saying if you have little, you give little. If you have more, you give more. It says you give is proportionate. But in the same verse, it says it needs to be proportionate. It needs to be in wisdom. Because there are many people uh, who have been taken advantage and impoverished by the prosperity gospel, right? I'm like, give within your means. Their, their families are suffering, which then is against God's principle. Their families are suffering. People are suffering. They're giving off their time in a way that jeopardizes their own family or their own marriage to God. God is like, no, 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 no. It should be constrained within biblical, within boundaries. And yet, it should be a sacrificial it should be sacrificial. And here's another thing. Uh, another thing about it is that he begins to talk to them about the personal benefits. That it has personal benefits. And it's not an easy thing to say because of the lies of the prosperity gospel, right? Which is basically a, a pyramid scheme of give, uh, you know, and it'll come back uh, uh, to you so... People avoid these scriptures because of that excess and that abuse where people now are, think, God, I give him money so that he gives us more. It's a self-enriching project. Now, the only people who benefit from the prosperity gospel are the preachers themselves and nobody else. No one in the body uh, benefits, but it's the preacher himself. But what does it mean to say giving has benefits? Here are the three benefits. There's one thing that... Uh, Acts chapter 20, verse 35, here's what it says. It says, remember, this is Paul talking. It says, remember, it's more blessed to give than to receive. More blessed to give than to receive. Two things there. Number one, this is the only time where the Lord is quoted and he didn't mention it anywhere in the gospel. This quote, you don't find it anywhere in the gospel. It's mentioned outside of the gospel. That's where you hear a red letter that is outside of the gospel, and he didn't say it anywhere. But what he was basically doing with this statement, he was quoting like, you remember the Lord, he was quoting like a mantra or a preaching or a message that the Lord had. And this is what it means. Usually when we, he is more blessed to give than receive, we start thinking about uh, the receiver is inferior. <laughs> like, ah, so if I'm receiving, no, no, all of us are recipients. But this is what it means. Uh, this, it means that it's talking about ambition. That if it's your ambition is to receive, which is to self-enrich, self-aggrandize, to, to, to earn and to hoard, that becomes a curse because you are opening up yourself on the chokehold of money and, and the world and the cares of this world. But if your ambition is to be blessed by God and you give, you're releasing then you are live in blessedness because these things, you're reducing the hold of these things. You're reducing your attachment to these things. You're making people happy. You're advancing the kingdom of God. So he's talking about ambition. That it's more, there's blessedness in giving uh, rather than in, in just acquiring and keeping to self. It's not doing like a superior that this is bad. He's just saying, listen, if your ambition is to give, and not just to hold. He's a blessedness that's there. So what's the number one uh, uh, benefit of giving? The blessing of the Lord. 
that there's a blessing in giving, that it's more blessed, it's more liberation that is coming. We can pray our way out of our attachments to things of this world, but there remains no greater deliverance than actually just doing it and letting go and saying, God, here it is, I give it to you. But the second benefit uh, that is there is mentioned is mentioned there. We usually ignore it. It actually says, God loves a cheerful giver. This seems to be indication that there's like a special love that God has for cheerful givers. Right? It says, God loves a cheerful giver. It's almost like God has a thing. God is looking. He's like, you know that thing like you have with your spouse or anything? It's just like you have this, you're around people, but you know, we have a thing that's going on. We have, it's just like a special love, a special relationship. God actually loves. Isn't this a benefit? Isn't this a benefit? That God loves a cheerful giver. But here's the other thing that, that the Bible actually teaches. Uh, uh, Luke 6 verse 38. Give and it all. Good measure. Okay, this side, this KJV version. <laughs> Give thou unto. <laughs> Give and it will come back to you. Good measure, press down, shake it together. And it actually talks here that whosoever so sparingly will reap sparingly. Whosoever sows bountifully will reap bountifully. Each one must give as he decided in his heart for God loves a cheerful giver. And verse 10, he supplies seed to the sower and bread for the food and you supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. Here's what he's talking about. We give so that we don't get. We give so that we give some more. When you give, God actually gives you good measure, pressed down, shake it together, running off. But look at the person that he gives to. He says he supplies seed to the sower. He gives back to the person who's continuously giving. He's not just enriching you to say, oh, I've managed I put this in the Lord and then it matured. Here's the interest. No, he's saying as long as you're a sower, you've decided, you know what, whatever I give, I'm going to sow. He provides seed to the sower. <laughs> he provides and that's one of the commitments that we need to make to experience the blessing of the Lord. I want to turn on the, I'm a sower, I want to be a sower so that you give seed and the harvest will come. So good measure, pressed down, shaken, running over. It's not for self-enriching people, it's for sowers. <laughs> for people who have made the decision and you've gotten on that journey uh, for sowers. But here's a thing, a place that we want to end up to before we go to the next slide. I was a Christian for a couple of years before I actually started giving uh, in any way. Uh, the Lord through his grace and people ministering, but also just getting practical tools that could help us, uh, you know, just figure out next steps in terms of our generosity journey. So here's a practical consideration I want to give. Here's a... a, 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 a you might have come across, there's a book that's written called The Generosity Ladder. And there are many things about the generosity ladder that are out there. But this is what it basically is. Go to the next slide. It's just a tool, right, designed to help people move from money being their God to money being a tool from God's kingdom. And it focuses on behaviors and attitudes of our hearts rather than on amounts and percentages further transforming us into the likeness of Christ. So it's not about, uh, you know, you've heard about churches where people say, the people with the 1,000 shillings this side. So it's not like uh, an, an, an ascension uh, of sorts. Each rung of the ladder represents growth in a lifestyle of generosity and sacrifice. These are not rungs uh, you slowly ascend to, to get to God, but simply a way to evaluate your growth in your generosity. Because scripture encourages us, 8 verse 7, that we need to grow in the grace of generosity. So it's not biblical, it's not a law that we're putting in this church, but it's just a tool to help us process uh, on our generosity journey. And I think it is useful 
uh, things that we could use. Here's a, uh, the first uh, rung on the ladder is the initial giver. This is someone who has not yet given to KVC, but you, wants to, you want to move from just being an attender. Where you've been coming, you love the church, it's good, the worship is great, uh, the, you know, the kids' church is great, you're blessed, you've actually identified as such, but you've just never given to the kingdom of God through KVC. So here's the thing to process that, would you need to make that decision to move to being an initial giver and to become one you need to consider just making that, that first step? And some of us need to make that donation, to say, that decision today to say, listen, I want to get on a generosity journey. And a step has to be made, right? A step has to be made. S second slide of the consistent uh, giver. This is someone who's a regular giver, giving many times through recurring payments, starting to think of giving in the same way about other things. Other expenses in your budget are paid regardless of seasons or fist and famine, right? Where having a lot or having little doesn't affect your giving. You're, you're consistent uh, in your giving. And you, you have to set it up. You have to budget for it. Uh, it. It needs to show up in your budget to say, you know what? I just don't want to give out at, at whims or when I'm whipped up or when a preacher comes or when, uh, you know, when PT is, is induced. But I actually want to be consistent. Because if you see 1 Corinthians 6, uh, uh, Paul is actually encouraging people to put a system in place. Because he's saying at the beginning of each week, please give. And he does that in many other places. Put a system in place to build uh, consistency. The next one is intentional. It's someone who thinks about the giving in relation to other things they spend their money on. They consider a percentage amount they want to consciously grow in. Look at their budget and here you're thinking, you're not just saying I want to be consistent, but you're thinking my view of God and my commitment to build his kingdom. This is my view of God. This is the commitment I have towards the kingdom. How does that reflect in my giving? Right? It's just to help you process uh, in your journey. So you you consider giving in relation to other monthly, uh, the same way you, you do those things, your mortgage, your insurance, you put them. And then you, this is a point where you could choose a percentage that will represent a new level of giving and potentially a tithe. Let me just mention there, just stop and mention, broad uh, topic. The New Testament doesn't talk about tithing. In fact, this is the most that Pete, Paul talks about money, two chapters, over 40 verses, but he doesn't mention the tithe, right? Jesus comes into contact with the Pharisees when they're talking about the tithe. He does not deny that you should tithe. There's no particular percentage. A tithe is a, it's a, it's a standard requirement. It's a guide, right? Because in the Old Testament, in fact, they tithe, they gave more than 10%. It was maybe 27% because they tithed to the temple, the tithes to the Levites, they tithed to the fists, and they tithes to the system of feeding the poor. But where we are at, we are at grace giving. Between us and the people in the New Testament, who has received more from the Lord? It's us. So the tithe is just a basic guideline. Should you tithe? Yes, if you, may, if you're, if you have that conviction, you should. It's important in that it's just a standard guide. That's what it is. But in the New Testament, it's actually grace giving, where we give more because we have received more from the Lord. So at this point, as an intentional giver, you determine whatever percentage you determine. But a tithe is just a standard. Whatever you, there's no, there's no sinful uh, percentage, but there's just a guiding principle of we are now in grace giving, in uh, cheerful giving, and in sacrificial giving era. The last one, uh, second last one, this is sacrificial giving. This is someone, go, someone who's no longer thinking, what am I supposed to give, but rather, what am I not giving, and why? <laughs> right? Like, what am I not giving? to the Lord. And why? This person is less concerned about 10 or 15% and more concerned about the 90 or 85%. Sacrificial uh, givers decide to make changes that cost them something in their lifestyle. Remember David saying uh, in First Samuel, uh, go to the next slide, here when he talks about, like, is my giving really costing me something? 
Is it really costing me something? Is it really sacrificial as an example that's set by the Lord? That's what you're doing at sacrificial giving. You're sitting down to, to actually reflect on that. And you're determining if there are resources God has blessed you in the past. And God is asking you to release as a sacrifice to him. And the last one is the legacy. These are people who consider the impact that what they have. They're no longer asking God, how much are you asking me to give? But God, how much are you asking me to keep? You're asking God in the light of who you are, in the light of your work, how much should I keep, Lord, and how much should I give f for this, right? Uh, go on, how? These are some of suggestions and tools to process. You're leveraging your journey of generosity to encourage and inspire kingdom generosity to the next generation. You are now thinking more of the generation. You're thinking about the future of gospel. You're thinking about the future of mission. Right? And this is an area that we need to grow in. As, as Kenya, we've been voted one of the most generous African countries. But I think we give more to need, more than to the glory of God and to the fame of God. I think a lot more times we're inspired by desperation and by need. But I, I pray that the Holy Spirit starts moving a lot of us, especially in the, in the next 50 to 80 years. Missionary funding is drying up. There's no money that's going to come from anywhere to support missions coming out of this continent and taking the gospel further. We have to start thinking. We have to start thinking at legacy giving. Like, what does this mean? What does this mean to start giving that way? Whether it's of ourselves, we, 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 we cannot, guys, we cannot. I was reading a book on missionaries in the, uh, from the Assemblies of God in the, who are coming to Africa. How they gave off themselves. That they used to put their clothes in the casket that they want to be sent back home with. Because there were, known, there were no known cures. People were dying of curable disease when they're going to these distant places. They've given off themselves. We want people on this continent to graduate as an engineer and not just think, oh, now I'm tamaking, I need to get a job. But how, how am I going to go to the mission field with this gift that God has given me for the sake of the gospel? We've got to think about that legacy of our own selves. We've got to move whatever form that it might take. There's need for us to wrestle with the need to set an example, with the need to start moving towards there and having that conversation for yourself uh, and for your family. I want to ask us to stand. I'll invite us to stand. We want to take up uh, this is not a special offering. This is not asking you to give more than you had planned. No. I just want you to give with a consciousness. <laughs> with a consciousness that God, there's more to this. We want to give just even in response to some of the areas that the Lord could have illuminated in your heart as I spoke. That it could have just prodded you that mm, this area you might, you might need to think of. Give in saying, Lord, as I give my offering, Lord, I... This is, not, this, is not my, this is not my God. Remember Jesus said you either worship God or man. He said, God, this is not it. But to say, God, I make, some of you are already on that journey, but make that commitment again. Say, God, I want to be on this generosity journey. I want to be on this generosity journey. And some of us, we just need to pray this morning, even if you have nothing to give this morning, I just want you to pray on behalf of yourself, your business or your company, that God make me a soul. Even as that offering basket goes in front of you, that God, I want to be a sower because you supply seed to the sower. I want my business to be a sower because you supply seed to the sower. I want our family to be a sower, sowing family. 
I want my children. I want, if, I, I want, I want to be a sower, oh God. And it is you who supplies seed to the sower. So let's just give with that consciousness and the, uh, prayerfully in response to that as we are led in worship and then I'll come back and close the service. Lord, Speak what is true. Lord, help us to trust and obey. Help us, oh God. Lord, we can hide from each other, but we cannot hide from you. Lord, may you free us uh, from the cares of this world, but may you also free us to give. And Lord, we also pray, Lord, for your children uh, who are here this morning are trusting you for breakthrough in this area. You are God who supplies seed to the sower. And help us, O oh God, just to hunger and thirst for this truth from your word. Um, help us, O oh God, as a church, as individuals, as family, as a church, and as a nation, O oh God, that to realize that it's more blessed to give than to receive. Now to him who's able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forever. And all of God's people said, Amen.